The breakdown in the infection control is just a manifestation of the culture and the practice. You know, the lack of leadership, the abdication of leadership by the dentist, the failure to accept responsibility by each of the staff members. But the reality is, if there's a failure, it's everybody's fault. And you owe it to your families to go home without bringing the funk with you, you know, without becoming uh, infected with some sort of infectious disease. And you know what? The difference between you guys in dentistry and me in law enforcement it was safe for me to see my back. I mean, it was safe for me to assume that everybody was trying to kill me until proven otherwise. And you should as well, honestly. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, episode number 194. My name is Andrew. And this is Michelle. Welcome back to another week and the end of Infection Control Awareness Month. Yes, it was um, widely, um, highly acclaimed. What is the critically acclaimed month of widely control? accepted, widely accepted, received well, all of the words that mean that people loved this one, which was surprising to me because I feel like we were going to see a huge uh, dip in our downloads because it's infection control. And we didn't. We saw um, people were really engaged. And so that's very exciting for us. That was really great. And I mean, we should all be caring about that. And you're going to hear that in this episode that I recorded yesterday for the second <laughs> time. We're talking about compliance and just the why behind what we're doing when we're practicing good infection control and making sure that not only you're, you are safe, your patients are safe, but also your loved ones because you're bringing in home all that funk. So, and I'm sure you talked about it um, on the episode, but this is going to be with Dwayne. He has talking with the Tooth Cup podcast, and that's what he talks about all the time is is the compliance, and he does it in a really fun uh, fun way. So it's nice to have him on. Sorry, I missed that one. Uh, it was good, um, and we are going to Dense Play Serona World. Soon. We are indeed. Right? Uh, yeah, beginning of October. Yeah, so we'll be at Dense Supply Serona World uh, October 3rd through the 5th. I've talked about it before on the podcast. One of the things I like most about Dense Supply Serona World um, as a conference is that they have individual tracks. And there's a hygiene track, there's a dental assisting track, there's supper dentist, there's all sorts of different things, different tracks you can choose from. Um, so I've downloaded the app. I've been able to select the courses that I'm going to be able to attend. The fortunate but also kind of unfortunate part is almost all of the hygiene tracks are all sold out. They're widely popular. But Dent Supply Serona was it's such a good meeting to go to. And, you know, we are all big fans of continued education, lifelong learning. I think you should always be switching it up. You should never just be like, I always go to this annual session. Like, no. You need, even though there's some good ones that are always fun to go to, you really need to be out there going to diff, maybe you go to Perio, maybe you go to Hygiene, maybe you go to Hinman, Greater New York, something, and switch it up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it changes your perspective on the outlook of the profession and kind of how other, it's like we talked about with the international stuff, right? You want to see it from a different perspective. And so changing it up a little bit is, uh, it's always a good idea. And by the time you hear this podcast, you'll have five days to still go sign up for Trivia Dent and take the quiz, which is all on dental acronyms. And you can win $200 uh, if you are the highest scorer of that quiz. Um, Andrew's won. Sarah Lawrence won last month. So you could be a winner this month. Just get over. I want to say about that is I do have an 80% going into this right now. So if anyone thinks that they can top my 80%, I'll be, and the worst part was like, I could have had one more, right? But I clicked too quickly at the last question and it left it blank. So I opened the door for everybody. Let's, let's give it a whirl. If only I could go take it, but I have some uh, involvement in this company. So I can't, that would be, <laughs> I wrote some of those questions, so that would not work, but you can go to trivia dent.com and try to beat Andrew. Please go do that. 
just for my pure amusement. That'd be great. Please beat him. Yeah. Embarrassing. Yeah. That'd be great. So this is going to be the final week of infection control. And we really do hope that you enjoyed this series. Always um, head over to OSAP. Uh, dot org and check out their um, information become a member of it's really inexpensive and you get to ask them questions try out their uh, annual conference speaking of annual conferences and switching that up if you are anywhere in that infection control part of the office where maybe you're the office or compliance manager or you're the OSHA manager whatever that is uh, you need to go to this course because you will learn your mind will just explode it's so amazing and then also check out um, Dwayne's podcast, Talking with the Tooth Cop, and check out his website. And we talk about what that is and how he helps um, compliance in across the country. But it's really cool that he started as a, an actual police officer and now is in the world of dentistry. So enjoy this episode with Dwayne Tinker. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. So listeners, to finish up and bookend our infection control month pretty nicely, we have a fellow podcaster on. His name is Dwayne Tinker, and he is with Talking with the Tooth Cop. Welcome to our podcast, Dwayne. Hey, thanks for having me, Michelle. Of course. But you go by Tink, right? Everybody calls me Tink, yeah. Tink. <laughs> That's such a fun name. You know, like you drop your fork and it goes, Tink. So, Tink, you are I'll never not... use that analogy again. That was terrible. <laughs> I'd say we edit it out, but I think we should keep it. <laughs> but I'm cool. That works. <laughs> so you, um, well, this is actually, I mean, I just, we are pretty transparent podcast. So we have tried to have this interview a few times. So fingers crossed it makes it to actual launching <laughs> with our podcast. But we wanted to bring you on because you have a company uh, that's all about dental compliance and you're all about infection control, but your history is not in dentistry. No. Tell us where it started. I was a career law dog. I was <laughs> oh, a, I've never uh, heard that before. Law man. In fact, I, I was a Texas law man. <laughs> all the history behind that. Yeah. No, I I grew up chasing my boyhood dream. I wanted to be a police officer and and want to be a paramedic and a fireman. And you know, there's some people that are dreamers and some people that are doers. And well, before you can be a doer, you have to be a dreamer. So I had my dream and I did them all. And um, you know, I did some time worked uh, in different EMS settings um, on ambulance services and whatnot. Um, I was a 911 dispatcher for a while. I was a firefighter. A volunteer firefighter. I was a uh, police officer, worked my way up through the ranks to uh, started out as a road deputy and uh, promoted up to investigations and eventually went to work for the state uh, as a state police officer for the Texas Dental Board. So I got to investigate naughty dentists for a living. What a hoot. Yeah. And I, you said that and I was like, I did not know that that was even a thing that you could be on the board of dentistry as a cop. Or a police officer. So what kind well, of things were you doing? I wasn't on the board. I, well, I wasn't You're on the board. I wasn't them. a board member. I was the staff person. Uh, I was yeah. on okay. yeah, day-to-day staff. So, But they, I was a commissioned police officer. I wore gun badge and handcuffs every time I walked into a dental office. So I was wore a coat, so nobody saw that. But, um, yeah, when people realize that, they're like, oh, my gosh. I mean, this guy says he was a cop, but he, he really was. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> the yeah, truth be told, the oldest. Uh, yeah, the the oldest dentist I ever arrested was seventy two years old. We, uh, you know, put him in handcuffs in front of his what? wife, put him in the back seat of the car, and uh, put his walker in the front seat and took him to the county jail. So, stop. Um, what? Yeah, for real. So, just try to help people understand exactly what I did. And what would what would have to happen for you, a dentist, to go into the back of a cop car? So that was kind of a, a really egregious situation. That was a sex offense. Um, Ooh, I, you know, I had all kinds of things that were anything involving a dentist or a dental office uh, and dentistry, whether it was civil, administrative, or criminal. And most of the criminal cases, I worked uh, jointly with other agencies. So that way I could work the administrative case while uh, we collaborated on the criminal case. So um, uh, most of the cases that I worked, though, were like patient complaints to the dental board. They were unhappy with their qualitative uh, outcomes, uh, unhappy with their the appearance, the outcome. 
and it always stems from uh, the patient's unhappiness or, um, you know, financial difficulties. But so I dealt a lot with that in more of an administrative role. I'm not a clinician, as I mentioned before. I've never been a dental assistant, uh, never I have no desire to be a dentist or a hygienist. I was really there for uh, a very specific purpose. Uh, I was also in charge of handling infection control complaints to the dental board. Uh, so, you know, being I was not a clinician, uh, for me to step into that role and stand toe-to-toe with the dentist and tell them, hey, their infection control stinks, <laughs> um, was, for me, was a real challenge because when I went to work for the dental board, they had no training program, and I really had to do some self-study to understand the difference between a crown and an autoclave, and you know, <laughs> I, I know the difference today. Um, Quite a difference there, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So y'all think I'm talking about the tooth crown. I was talking about the crown on your head versus the autoclave, but um, that, that's where I started from. <laughs> So, you know, I realized the seriousness of what I, I was doing and I really had to dig in and learn this stuff. And what I discovered is that it's not easy. You know, I deal with a lot of different aspects of, of compliance today and infection control. It's just uh, it's astounding at some of the challenges that we face to figure things out, you know. And you're going into multiple offices throughout the country right now with your do, company, yeah. which is yes. the dental compliance Specialist. Mm, thank you. It's like there's a yeah. third word there. Dental there compliance is. specialist. And how long have you uh, been doing that? I left the dental board. I resigned my position at the board in 2011 and started the next day. Ah. And uh, I've never looked back. Nice. So, so you've gone into probably, I would imagine, hundreds of offices at this point. Yeah, I've lost count. It's north of 1,500 offices in the oh, last wow. eight years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So when you're going into those offices, like what are some of the things that you're doing? What are some of the problems that you're tackling uh, with the, these, these dental professionals? So I work in a lot of different domains within compliance. Um, so it really kind of depends on what I'm working on with the, with the particular client. Uh, I've got one, in fact, today that I'm working on doing, putting together their Medicaid marketing plan to train their outreach staff and the do's and don'ts. So I work a lot in the Medicaid space and I really enjoy that. I work a lot with OSHA uh, separately. I also work a lot in, in the infection control space, which is what we're here to talk about. But I would say those two in particular, the Medicaid and infection control, are really nearest and dearest uh, to my heart uh, right up there with sedation safety. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I love... What are some big... Oh, go ahead. You love what? <laughs> you love... Well, I was going to say, I love making dental offices safer with what I do. Yeah. And I've got a cool story I'll share with you here in a little bit. Yeah, no, let's tell us now. It's great. I love well, stories. So, uh, yeah, I love going and doing inspections at dental offices. And, you know, what I do isn't rocket science. I mean. It feels like it, though. <laughs> it feels like um, But, you know, I, I've taken the time to make up my checklist it, just to make sure that I'm consistent when I'm working with the client so that every office I look at, I'm looking at the same things. And, you know, um, so consistency is key, right? Mm-hmm. So the things I'm looking at, they're not rocket science. They're not things that your staff isn't already aware that they need to take care of. It's just mm-hmm. that the problem is that they just, they don't. So like when I do a sedation inspection, one of the things that we're looking through is, you know, their equipment. Do, do they have what they need to provide adequate care? Um, are there drugs within the expiration period? Do they have, does the defibrillator work? Are they within, do they have pads that are within their expiration? Do they have the appropriate reversal agents for the sedation medications that they're using? You know, can the staff articulate their, can the dentist and staff articulate the uh, appropriate uh drug amounts for if they need to reverse a sedation and things like that. And um, I'm surprised at how common and how, how common some of these small issues are. People may or may not have like an emergency plan. They may have uh, the idea that, hey, if something happens, we'll figure it out. And that's not the time to figure things out. Um, so I do a lot of uh, sedation inspections with dental offices and, and I find and help correct a lot of issues. And I had a client call me up here. Uh, well, it was Three weeks ago yesterday, texted me and said, hey, Tank, um, I think the patient's okay, but we had a problem, and I'd like to discuss it with you. Can you call me, like, you know, kind of soon? Kind of let me know there's an urgent problem, and that's mm-hmm. not a good situation to wake up to. So I called him right quick, and uh, he said, hey, we had a patient we were doing a sedation on. The, uh, it was a pediatric patient. Uh, she went into cardiac arrest. We ended up shocking her a few times. Um, we got her back. The paramedics transported her to the hospital, and as far as we know, at this point, it sounds like she's got a really good prognosis. Yikes. Scary, though. It, it was very scary. But what was really 
cool to hear from the dentist. He said, you know, you know, we did some scenarios together and you really held our feet to the fire about some things that we thought we were good on, but you didn't accept that from us. And you really kind of pushed back on us to make us up our game. And it's because of that, I believe that this patient is alive today. When this, when the situation happened, we did it exactly as we planned, exactly as we, exactly as we trained because you made us do it. And uh, everybody was really calm and it, it followed the plan. And I'm like, wow, that's cool. You know, I'm no longer in public safety, but I'm still helping yeah. by proxy, helping save lives. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Well, in the episode with Michelle Lee from OSAP, we she mentioned that it would be a really smart idea for us to highlight these things that we do to keep our patients safety. So don't just, you know, flippantly say, and here's our sterilization area, and you keep on going past it, like highlight the things that you're doing to keep that patient safe. I think that that's something that's also very smart to highlight, maybe even on your social media, say, you know, when they're taking these classes, or maybe you're walking through the office or whatever it is that they're doing to take that extra step, like highlight that, tell the world that you're doing that, because not only are you doing amazing cosmetic work or perio or endo or whatever it is, but you're doing all of these things that they might not see just in case. Right. I think it's yeah, great marketing. Talk- I do too. You know, you and I talked about this uh, in the last time we recorded here about, uh, you know, I recommend people publish their uh, CFU counts when they do water testing. You know, it, we know that most of the dental community is not testing their dental water. So to show one that you're testing and two, that you're far exceeding the EPA standards for safe dental water uh, in your practice. There's so much marketing going on out there. You've got to rise above the noise mm-hmm. beyond, um, you know, that's I think one way to do that. Is waterline safety one of the most common things that you're seeing when you go into these offices and or check infection control or questions that you get? Yeah, I think it's common. It's one of the more common things because it's the most contemporary issue that seems to be, you know, kind of evolving here in recent mm-hmm. years. Um, mm-hmm. It's one that's had the most discussion, you know, because of things like, you know, the case that happened out in Anaheim and, and Atlanta a few years ago where now we can point to a number of cases where some patients were were physically harmed by neglect uh, at the dental office. So, and I think we're going to continue to see that. So this is a conversation that will certainly continue. I agree. So if that's the more contemporary one, do you have a common one that you see often? Or just a question you're like, hygienists are always asking this. An example I would imagine would be handpiece hand pieces and sterilizing them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get pushed back on that one a lot. I was on a forum just this morning, actually. People were commenting about that. Yeah, it's a difficult conversation to have, really, because you know people are, uh, you know, people get hot about that when you tell a dentist that they're gonna, they need to spend money. <laughs> well, there's problem number one. You're telling a dentist they have to spend money. Uh, number two is your your suggesting that they need to buy some more hand pieces and help trying to help them understand the rationale when having to try and explain the CDC's rationale and, um, you know, without having the science in my back pocket to whip it out and show them, say, hey, you know, here's what the CDC has found and, and so on. Yeah, they like to push back on that. So, yeah, hand piece issues. Um, a lot of what I see because, you know, when I do, I really get into the nitty gritty when I'm doing infection control inspections. I'm really looking at their instrument processing um, I find a lot of cross-contamination issues. You know, we know that we need to go from a clean to a dirty, yes, mm-hmm. uh, if you will. Um, and I see a lot of, I, I do a lot of reorganization and sterilization areas to make sure that we go in one, we move in one direction with right. our instrument process and we're not jumping around mm-hmm. from a clean area to a dirty area to a clean area. I see a lot of misuse of, you know, cold sterile or glutaraldehyde. Oh, okay. People sterilizing things they shouldn't be. Reusing single-use devices, Mm -hmm. you know, after I see a lot of mistakes with cold sterile, so I'm just not a fan altogether. You know, I I found an office here not too long ago Mm -hmm. that was, uh, they were using ultrasonic enzyme solution for cold sterile, not realizing it was not (gasps) glutaraldehyde. You hear the mic drop? Oh, God. (laughs) Oh, no. I, I was so shocked when I saw that that I, I had to stop and, and revisit on this like three times to make sure that I was really understanding this correctly. And in oh. the end, she realized, oh, my God, this is a big deal. And the uh, the unfortunate thing is she was looking at the color 
of the solution and not the name on the bottle. Yeah. In fact, um, yeah, it was bad. I'm sure those things happen quite often. And I don't want to say it's a level of education because I see hygienists that go through all these courses too and are supposed to be getting their infection control every time they renew their license. I see that happening even with those. So I don't want to be like on the job, a trained assistant's can't figure it out because I was on the job, the train on the job trained assisting. And I do look back at some of my behavior and I'm like, Oh, that, that was, that was bad. But yeah. what, what is the reason for, like you mentioned, that, that feels pretty egregious. Like that's a, that's a big deal. Like what yeah. is the reason for it? Just hustling and they're too busy or really just not knowing the facts. You know, I think I'm going to surprise everybody with my answer. I think everybody's expecting mm-hmm. me to say that, you know, people are just dumb or incompetent. <laughs> Here's what I think. Complacency is a big issue. Um, distraction, a huge issue. There are so many demands placed on hygienists and dental assistants. And when it comes to, you know, compliance, it comes to, you know, new things that we need to do to make our patients safe. We're talking about adding activities to our daily routine. You know, we're placing that added burden on people's shoulders. And the more we ask of them, um, you know, there's so many demands on them. I, I think a lot of people feel like they're having to juggle balls and, and really struggle to keep all those balls in the air and keep those plates spinning, if you will. Mm-hmm. And I think that's I think that's more the reality than to say that there's just incompetence or stupidity or whatever you want to, you know, people want to chalk that up as. Because, you know, I mean, there are there is some level of stupidity out there, but that's generally not the norm. That I see. Well, I would suspect that it should be a top down kind of initiative. Oh, yeah. But yeah. we un- we know that that's not always happening amongst either whoever's your leader in the practice, if it's the dentist, if it's the DSO, if it's the corporate, if it's the office manager. But I do feel that a lot of the times that I might miss something with infection control. They've stacked patients, you know, I'm taught, I'm just like not caring so much about putting it in the container to go from my room to, to the other room. Cause that's just one more step, you know, like those are the moments right. where I'm like, let me cut the corners and then my scruples and morals come into play. I'm like, oh, I can't do it. But it's usually in those times of being overwhelmed, busy. And like you said, just spinning yeah. the plates. Yeah. I see that a lot. So do you have suggestions that you give those offices? Yeah. I mean, every office succeeds or fails as a team. It's not any one person's fault, but the reality is if there's a failure, it's everybody's fault. That's a good point. In the in the cases that I've seen with the, the most egregious and shocking uh, infection control problems, and some of which you guys have seen and read about in, in the news, the breakdown in the infection control is just a manifestation of the culture and the practice. You know, the lack of leadership, the uh, the, the abdication of leadership by the dentist, um, the failure to accept responsibility by each of the staff members. One particular case I had, there was, I think, three hygienists in the practice and a couple of dental assistants, and they hated each other personally. Wouldn't even accept the responsibility for cleaning their own operatory. They would, uh, you know, well, that's not my responsibility. That's hers. And if she doesn't do it, I don't care. That's her problem. I'm like, no, shame on y'all. Every <laughs> one of you has a responsibility to, to make sure that your operatory is safe. That was a really bad case. But I see that a lot, maybe not to that degree, but I think, um, you know, the culture and the practice really uh, uh, affects the overall success of the practice. And so accepting responsibility and being accountable to each other and to your patients, I think is essential. My advice to anybody that's in a situation where that they can't control that is to leave and go to an environment where you can contribute positively to that culture. And being held accountable in a way that you can give it and accept it as well, because sometimes that's, we kind of get a little, our feelings hurt or something like that. Or somebody points out that maybe we had like one speck of blood left consistently around a suction or something like that. And knowing that it's not trying to shame you, but it's, it's about patient safety at the end of the day, we have to make our patients healthy and safe. And at, like OSAP says, have the safest dental visit Dental visit every yeah. time. Well, I, my th- thought was, A lot of times the issues that I have run into amongst assistants or temps 
I'm in an office now where we're all volunteers. So we got people just the coming and going and I'm a big fan of labeling <laughs> because okay. of this so that you can say clean hands, dirty hands, because sometimes I see people shutting that autoclave with dirty gloves, but then I'm coming along with clean hands, undoing mm -hmm. it and pulling the stuff out or shutting cabinets or whatever. So do you have a good protocol to help people like be very mindful of what they're actually touching in that process? Best answer on that is because you don't know what the person in front of you or behind you has done or going to do is when you're in a clinical area and you need to touch something, put gloves on first, <laughs> always. That way there's no question. It, you know, always have that barrier between you and the, the enemy that you can't see. Okay, so that brings me to another question then. <laughs> because I have, I guess maybe it was instilled in me and maybe I need to update my thinking on this as well. But if you have gloves on, I just assume you're, you have dirty hands. So if I'm walking past anything and you're using gloves, let's say you're in a clean room and mm -hmm. I don't know, you're doing something that normally I was taught that you could have a good wa hand wash, a proper hand washing and set the room up with maybe the chair barrier, the light barriers. But so if I walk past the room and I see a student with gloves on, I'm like, are those clean gloves or those dirty gloves? What are those? Yeah. And so I guess in my mind, I, I, I so I don't know, is there a, a new protocol for that or a recommendation? Just always be gloved? You know, that's an interesting question, I guess, one I haven't pondered. The one that I always feel concerned about is when I see somebody leave the operatory with gloves on. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I have that same question. Are those clean or dirty? And what are mm -hmm. you touching? Exactly. <laughs> what do I not need to touch because you've touched it? So I don't know that I have the best answer on that one. Yeah, because this has happened to me where they've handed me a paper chart. Like they were in the room oh, yeah. with... And they were like, no, it's clean gloves. I was just had got done like setting up the room and I just brought you the chart from the previous patient. And I'm like, but I don't know if those are clean gloves or dirty gloves. Like, I don't yeah. know what you're handing me right now. But I think just outside of the operatory, that's a good point as well. It's gross. Yuck. I hate paper charts. Oh, I know. They're just hitting. Oh, they're awful. Home. So antiquated. And I hate touching paper charts. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one that feels that way. Goodness. No, no. They probably had a ton of aerosols throughout the, the days. So yeah. speaking of aerosols, are you having, are, do you see a lot of times where pay, the professional is not wearing their mask properly or the proper kind of mask? Yes and yes. I'm actually shocked at how often I see people not wearing a mask and then how often I see people walking around with their mask on, around their elbow um, or they wear their mask over their chin. Now I have a goatee. I know y'all can't see this, but so I can see why I might wear one to, you know, keep all the germs out of my goatee. But ladies, I don't understand why y'all wear a chin on your or a mask on your chin. <laughs> it doesn't protect your uh, your mouth and your nose if you're not wearing it properly. But yeah, wearing improper masks. Oh my gosh, you know, people. Uh, well, I see a lot of offices that will only buy the cheapest mask they can get their hands on. It doesn't matter if it's the right mask or not. By gosh, it's a mask, and we're checking that box, and we're moving on. And they're not willing to go back and consider new options. And I think that's kind of a, that's definitely a concern. Yeah, I think with anything that you do, you have to go back and look at it and evaluate periodically. Is this the best thing for us today? That's interesting. And you and I kind of touched on this a little bit post podcast last time was aerosols, yeah. because I find it very fascinating that we as an industry were required to do bloodborne pathogens, which I, I think mm -hmm. is great, but Really, in bloodborne pathogens, we're talking HIV, we're talking hepatitis. Um, of course, we do talk TB a lot, but that's not really a bloodborne pathogen. Yeah. So, when we look at aerosols, and there's an aerosol standard, we don't talk about that very much. But we have measles now as a big concern, chickenpox, the flu, TB. Like these are major concerns for when we are just blasting out those aerosols. And since we are the healthcare field that produces the most of aerosols, it's shocking to me that we aren't talking more about aerosols. Yes, a stick is very scary. We get stuck and you're like, oh my God. I have... But really, when's, when's the time that somebody transmitted hepatitis or HIV via stick? Like, 
Yeah, it's been a long time. Very long time. But when's the last time you had a sinus infection, like recurrent in your uh, as a clinician? Yeah. Asthma or bronchitis. I got a cold after a patient was in there. Yeah. Like these are the things that I think we need to have bigger conversations about. And we just we don't. And then we don't we laugh and so flippantly wear our personal protective equipment. <laughs> You know, and I mentioned this last time, so I should, I, I, I've got to mention it again here. So I'm going to reach back to my law enforcement experience and talk about protective measures for just a second, because I think this is a good point for everybody. Mm -hmm. So once upon a time, I became a field training officer and it was my job to train rookie officers. And some of those cops that I got to teach how to be better cops and do it our way at the agency I worked for, um, whether they were new or lateral transfer, they had to spend time with three different FTOs for four weeks at a crack. And um, day one, I would sit down with my rookies and say, look, I've got two rules here. Rule number one is whether we're doing uh, five miles an hour or 105 miles an hour, we will always wear our seatbelt. And whether it's five degrees or 105 degrees, we'll always wear our protective vest because you owe it to your significant other and I owe it to mine and we owe it to each other's families. We both come to work safe. We go home safe. So you have to put those safety mechanisms in place. And some of these guys would just whine and complain about the seatbelt. Oh, my gosh, you know, I mean, you know, what if we're patrolling through a neighborhood and I have to jump out for a foot chase and I get caught in the seatbelt that gets caught in my badge or I get caught in my gun? Or what if somebody starts shooting on us and I have to get my gun out of my holster and I get caught in the seatbelt? Well, those are training opportunities. Those aren't excuses. That's a reason. That's a something that you need to train through and we did um i had many many officers that we pulled over and told dispatch we were unavailable for training for a few minutes we would empty the, uh, the ammunition from our weapons and we would practice drawing our gun with the seatbelt on in the car until we could do it with our eyes closed and from muscle memory so identify those excuses that you make about why you don't wear your ppe and then you figure out a way to do it yeah. You put your heavy duty gloves on and you practice cleaning instruments, placing them in your peel pouch, sealing the peel pouch with your heavy duty gloves on. And for the same reason, because you come to work safe, you owe it to your families to stay safe and you owe it to your families to go home without bringing the funk with you, you know, without becoming uh, infected with some sort of infectious disease. And you know what? The difference between you guys in dentistry and me in law enforcement it was safe for me to see my back. I mean, it was safe for me to assume that everybody was trying to kill me until proven otherwise. And you should as well, honestly. But the difference between you and me, I could see my bad guy most of the time. Yeah. I was standing toe to toe with him. You guys have no idea where your bad guy is, where those infectious uh, disease, uh, you know, where those pathogens may be lurking in your right. office. And um, because of that, your enemy is more dangerous to you, primarily because of your complacency than mine was to me. And think about that for a minute. I, it is very intense to think about that. And I think also we need to put more weight on everyday bacteria or every day, the common cold, the sinusitis, the, you know, the, the bronchitis, the people with strep mutans that are now going into your nose, like those things don't belong there. And they're going to create some serious concerns yeah. um, going into your hair, all kinds of places that these aerosols fall and, they linger up to 30 minutes in the operatory. So you also mm -hmm. have to remember like when you're pulling that mask off, like breathing through your nose, wearing maybe additional things that uh, engineered nose filters, things like that, that will help you. And I think also think, thinking about your patient as well, like yeah. what's making sure you're using that high volume and that pre-procedural rinse because P. gingivalis, it's in the mouth. It doesn't necessarily yeah. belong in the nose and it's an opportunistic infection or a bacteria pathogen. So if they breathe that in, because there's always those patients that are like, I get sick every time I come here and we're always like, mm, okay, uh, okay, Karen, yeah. like I get it. Like, uh, but we all have that one patient, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, who, in the moment we say that they exactly know who we're talking about, but they're probably correct. Yeah. They're probably correct, and it's our job to take some of those infection control um, procedures very serious. I completely agree with you. You know what I think a lot of that complacency comes from? By nature, we're all relationship-oriented people. Mm -hmm. And when we know, like, and trust our patient, 
when we review the patient's medical history and they don't reveal that they have any infectious disease, you know, we build that subconsciously, we build that maybe false sense of security or mm -hmm. trust, if you will. So it's easy for us to just fall into that lull of, you know, we're okay, I don't have to wear double glove. Whereas, you know, if we treat a patient that looks like, you know, they're disheveled, they're, you know, they look like they got some infectious disease, maybe all of them, you know, we're more likely to double glove. But, you know, we know I can trust our patients. We're like, eh, I'm all right. She's not coughing. She looks healthy. We have an you know. emotional bias towards them. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. it's true. And the funny thing is, yeah, and the funny thing is um, I believe that the, the better the report, the more likely the person is to have something that we don't want to contract. And as you know, wrapping up our session last time, something you said is, that, you know, I, I said to you that, hey, I don't have the funk. And you said, yeah, but your germs may not be harmful to you, but they could be harmful to me. And I thought, wow, that really, I spent a lot of time thinking about that after you mentioned that. Interesting. I, I mean, I always joke that I have emotional bias against children because they're all dirty and gross to me. Yeah. So <laughs> I think that's kind of how we have, but they have the cold and their sniffles and their, yeah. you know, wipe in their nose and I, I, but it's true like you might not be having a host response in that moment to whatever pathogen that's lying in your mouth but if i breathe that in if i wipe my face or my eyes or my nose with whatever my host response even depending on if i'm immune compromised if i'm having gut inflammation whatever that looks like i could have yeah. a very different response to it so i think we exactly. do need to get more serious about aerosols i agree well, yeah. I'm also curious about if we're talking aerosols, how many people are you still seeing with the spray disinfectants? <laughs> Quite a few. Yeah. Uh, it's always an interesting conversation. Sometimes I don't have time to have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that's a good point. And um, so if we could talk then about what are some changes that you have seen since you've been doing this for a few years now, what are some changes that you're seeing in dentistry? You know, when you had your interview with Michelle Lee, she mentioned, you know, the evolution of the infection control officer. I think we're going to continue to see that take shape in dental offices in the next several years here. And thank goodness, um, because somebody has to be in charge. And if no one person's in charge, then nobody's in charge. And I'm seeing a lot of that. So I'm, I'm thankful to see this trend. The other thing I, we see is that, um, you know, across the board that patients are genuine or are, patients are typically more informed, better informed about their dental care. They're better informed about the standards, about what to expect, about uh, processes and things like that. And they're becoming more adept or more aware of what to look for in dental, dental offices. And they're seeing these news stories about how patients are getting sick from going to the dentist. So, you know, you have a smarter consumer. I think we're going to continue to see dental offices being turned in for infection control problems when they don't meet standards and they don't meet acceptable guidelines and put their best foot forward toward preventing avoidable infections. And with that, of course, when those stories hit the news, there's reputational harm to the practice, and we're seeing a lot of that. You know, you look at the situation with the um, case out in Anaheim with these mm -hmm. children that were, you know, infected uh, due to uh, poor dental water quality, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, there was some updates to these lawsuits there that the families are seeking punitive damages. And so we have reputational harm. The, it was a 12 group practice. So it was basically decimated and sold off. And now they're really feeling the financial pinch on top of that reputational harm. So we're going to continue to see that. So when we talk about finances, because to circle back to your comment that it is very hard to get a dentist to spend money, buy new hand pieces, things like that. How much does it hurt though to have to pay out when you are breaching infection control or any compliance for that matter? You know, I can't speak to that in the first person because I've never had to write a check for a, an egregious type situation like that. But uh, I would imagine that's got to be really painful, you know, um, in the, those situations. Within the, you know, there's a lot of people that uh, you know, salespeople that I've talked with over the years and, you know, we all, we've all seen it. There's dentists that are like penny wise and pound foolish. And, you know, rather than pass judgment on those people, I think the best thing that we can do is, you know, surround them with a little bit of love and support and education, help them understand the information that they need to hopefully make some better decisions about how to spend their money wisely to protect themselves and their patients. I heard a quote this week, actually, and uh, it, it's a real problem when, you're counting the cents and not the dollars. 
and you're paying yeah. more attention to the little micromanaging stuff, like a hand piece here, a hand piece there, and you're really not looking at the dollars that you could be saving yourself or spending later on when you are getting in trouble for those infection control breaches. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, a lot of that concern about spending pennies, you know, we all have financial conditioning and beliefs about money and finances. And, you know, when you grow up in an environment, like a lot of us did in our generation, you know, we grew up where, you know, you finish the food on your plate, nothing is wasted. And when things break, well, first of all, don't break them, but when they break, fix it. Um, yeah. So, you know, you're having to unlearn some of those um, beliefs that we're raised with. And, and sometimes we're not even aware that we have those biases and, you know, we fail to see how they play into uh, our business and how they can adversely impact our business. I think one of the best things that we can do is always be the best students that we can be, you know, both personally and professionally. You know, how do we grow and become more uh, how do we grow and become smarter than we were yesterday and become the better, best version of ourselves every day, every day. And some people, some people just aren't into that. So that's, uh, well, this is where I get frustrated with hygienists when they, because we get very annoyed with our patients and their ambivalence towards home care, coming in for their appointments, caring for their mouth, wearing their night, whatever it is, right? Where yeah. the things that we've begged them to do. If you can't get out of your own ambivalence towards a situation and your complacency and apathy, then how do you expect your patients? So don't ask your patients to do something that you're not even willing to try. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you. And you know what? I bet a lot of us do that and don't even yeah. realize. Oh, absolutely. We're doing that absolutely. Now. And I could go on a whole, th but if anybody wants to hear more about that, look at motivational interviewing and we have a podcast on that. Just the, the, how to pull yourself out of ambivalence because we, we all do it without realizing it too. Like sure you do. said. Yeah. So for one of the predictions in the future of dentistry, are you seeing a trend towards more environmentally friendly infection control, like either barriers or sprays, like UV light sanitizers or ozone sprays? I'd like to say yes, honestly. And keep in mind, it's only the good people that call me. Yeah. So I work with really good practices, but that's not even, the, that's not even part of the conversation that we're having. Okay. Most people's reality is, you know, existence. <laughs> you know, we're so busy. We're trying to figure out how to do all this infection control stuff and see patients and have a profitable practice. And something's got to give. Something's always got to give. So, you know, we talk about trying to be more efficient. That they might be interested in. But environmental safety, that's not a conversation that happens, mm. sadly. No, Not but I world. get it. Like there's a lot of day to days and that seems kind of like the minutia, but I do yeah. hear it in other countries more and more. So I was just curious when it's going to make its way to the U S well, it depends on which part of the U S because that's, that's how true. You're working, working with different dental practices throughout the United States. I've got to say the Northern Western Northeastern United States is uh, many years ahead of say the Southern United States. Now, I'm a Texan, so, you know, it almost hurts to say that. But <laughs> it's like stepping back in time, driving across certain state lines sometimes. That's interesting. I'd like to maybe touch on that a little bit more because you hear the more progressive, like, states and dental uh, you know, passing mm -hmm. laws, are, you know, like Wisconsin, Minnesota, Washington, Oregon, California, are, are those very similar in the world of infection control as well and compliance? In my experience, yes. Yeah. Um, you know. Are there some states that are just being very progressive, like their state board is like, because I know Washington's about to pass something where you have to use high volume anytime you're using ultrasonic scalers or any aerosol producing procedure. Yes. And I believe uh, if I'm not mistaken, they either did or are about to pass some regulations requiring regarding water testing at specific intervals and things like that. What's really, what I see is, um, you know, there's a lot of people don't realize, first of all, that there's an organization for state dental boards. So representatives from every state board, they get together a couple of times a year, once a year, whatever, and they share and exchange ideas. And um, so when somebody does something in one state 
it kind of sets uh, in motion for that regulation to roll out in other other areas. And I've seen that with quite a few regulations, especially regarding controlled substances mm. uh, here in recent years. So, so I like looking to those progressive states because they really forecast what's coming. And it gives me the opportunity to start having that conversation with folks in states that are not as progressive or maybe they are anti-progressive, if you will, that, hey, in the next, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 years, this is what's going to happen here. And um, so people can kind of get out, get over that shock and start, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working through their disgruntledness, if you will, and start planning for that. The inevitable <laughs> change. People uh, hate change. They, especially in dentistry. <laughs> yes, they do. We really have an, a huge issue with it. So we have a lot of new grads and students um, and quite a, um, honestly, a lot of veteran hygienists that have, you know, taken to this podcast. So I'm curious if you have any advice for new grads and students as they progress into an, an office. I think the hygiene programs are pretty strict, you know, hair up, you know, jewelry, nails cut, all those things. And then we go into an office and we get that tribal mentality. And if they're not staying up on yeah, that um, information, do do. exactly. <laughs> we don't wear clinical jackets. Ah, yeah. You don't need to wear those masks. Level one mask for everyone. It's no big deal. Yeah. You know, all that stuff they teach you in school. What a so bunch of fooey. We don't necessarily yeah, do that around fine. here anymore. They just do that to, they just do that to make you learn yes. something or something, but that's not the way we do it. Exactly. How do they progress into those yeah. offices? Any suggestions on that? I have a few thoughts on that. I, I dropped one of those okay. uh, just a few moments ago. One is, you know, um, wake up every day with the, the goal, the determination that you're going to be a better version of yourself. You know, always be improving, always be studying, always be, uh, be, be becoming a better person. And two, going into dentistry, dental hygiene, whatever um, aspect of dentistry you work in, um, Take a moral inventory, understand what you believe and what you don't believe, identify right and wrong and stand on those beliefs because you're going to be tested. You know, some of you will start out going and temping in, in different dental offices and you're going to see things that will make, that will blow your mind. And uh, you'll see things that will test you uh, on a very deep level and make you question whether you've got into the right profession or not. At some time, somebody may ask you to do something that you know is wrong, that, that will make you feel like uh, like you're a cat and somebody just pet you backward, you know, mm. to just make the hair in the back of your neck just stand up, just make you feel completely uh, uh, bristled, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so figure out what you'll tolerate and what you won't, you know. Uh, and maybe something like, hey, you know, let's go ahead and just build that out as a full quadrant of scale and root planing. I know you only did, you know, two teeth there, but just go ahead and just write it up as a full quad. You know, it may start out as uh, that slippery slope with uh, just simple, slightly devious uh, activities until you find yourself knee deep and, you know, helping somebody with their organized crime and fraud to, you know, sweeping infection control breaches under the, under the rug or, you know, standing by as you have a dentist that you work for that's maybe grossly underdiagnosing care and superv providing supervised neglect for a patient or, you know, a, a number of other issues like that. So I promise you'll be tested at some point and it'll be in a way that it'll surprise you and at a time that you least ex expect it. So uh, just know how you'll react, what you'll tolerate and what you won't, because uh, ultimately where you draw the line is where the line is. So um, Ooh, don't good. tolerate bad behavior. That's great. And don't, don't describe, don't be bad behavior either. <laughs> so, those are my two biggest pieces. Of yeah. Don't be that person. And if, and if your people yeah. are telling you, you are that person, there's always a little truth in criticism. That's what I've learned. Well, the other thing is if you don't know who that person is in your office, it's probably you. Maybe you're, maybe you're that person. <laughs> It is probably you. Well, this was another great conversation and I do want to um, promote your podcast because you talk not just about infection control, control, but all compliance. I listened to your waterline one a few times. I'm trying to, I'm of course blanking on every podcast I've listened to of yours now, <laughs> all the topics, but you, you have a lot of good ones. More than one. Well, so, I mean, I don't think any of our listeners would be surprised that I would nerd out on dental compliance <laughs> with research and information. Uh, like, I love it. So if um, you 
or the listener want to hear more, you should check out Talking with the Tooth Cop podcast. And then where can they find more info um, if they want to utilize your services? So uh, we have a pretty good Facebook presence. Uh, I've got a Facebook group. Go to Facebook and look up the Dental Compliance Group. Send me an invite. Come join us. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. DDS Compliance is our handle. We're on Instagram as Dental Compliance Specialists. Um, and I have an email list. If you go to our website, dentalcompliance.com, uh, you know, over the years, I've put together a lot of forms and just a lot of really good information for my clients. And I recently decided to unlock the vault and start sharing that. So get on the email list and uh, get some of those resources. So thank you for coming back on and doing this a second Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Like, Thanks I think it's me. like, what are our fourth scheduled one and our second actual yeah. recording, but I feel like we, we hit some really good topics this time. Yeah. Well, certainly so, one of these days I'm going to meet your, uh, your counterpart. Yeah. Cause he's actually working today. So he, he? <laughs> couldn't join okay. us again, but yeah, one of these days you will meet, uh, Andrew, but I thank you for your time and I well, encourage certainly. everybody to go check out the podcast, the website, join the email list, at least join an Instagram and Facebook account. That's so easy. And, um, yeah. thank you again for coming on. Thanks for having me, Michelle. I appreciate it. Goodbye everybody. And best wishes to y'all. Well, I hope you guys um, enjoyed that. I know we kept like saying how this was our second one. Both conversations were really good. I wish they, the first one had made it to launch, but you know, technical difficulties were famous for them. And I do hope you check out uh, Dwayne's uh, website, follow him on Twitter or Facebook, Instagram, whatever that looks like for you. Um, Cause he, he's um, a wealth of knowledge and definitely listen to his uh, podcast. And so next week is the launch also of the new Dental Podcast Network, Channel 1 and Channel 2. Make sure you guys are heading over there and subscribing to both those channels. Lots of really cool content. Again, it's going to be short format podcasts, less than 20 minutes. Some of them, even as short as 10 minutes. And I recommend you listen to on your way to work that day, get energized, get prepared for the day, get in the right mindset to see patients. And then... On the way home, you can listen to another one since we have two channels, or you can switch over to your favorite uh, other podcasts like like Dwayne's podcast. So you start listening to his. Yep. And we also want to thank PDT, Paradise Dental Technologies, for always supporting the podcast and bringing you the CE portion of this podcast. So you can check the show notes. The link for the CE test is in those show notes through CE Zoom. You should definitely also subscribe uh, or become a member or log in or whatever that looks like for CE Zoom. <laughs> Do that. And that way you can track your credits. Um, and if you have multiple licenses, that's the best part. You can track your CE for multiple licenses. And um, again, if you're at one of these conferences, if your rep is coming in and you're looking for new instruments, check out PDT. Um, if you ever want me to sit with you at a booth, and show you the Gleason guide to sharpen those instruments, I'm your girl. Like, pull me over. I could spend all day because I'm a big, 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 big fan of the Gleason guide because our instruments are always sharp and I never have to try hard. <laughs> awesome. Very exciting. I think that's it for my end. I hope everyone has a good week, though. Yeah. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, y'all.